Welcome to another episode of The Home Stretch. I'm Alex Simmons. Over the next 30 minutes, we're going to stretch our legs a bit and give you a look into some of the stories we've been chasing this summer. With school back in session, the bell is also ringing for high school athletics, and that includes the pigskin. We made our way all over town to take a look at what each Naperville area team has to offer in 2013. Much like the skies above, the disposition of a football team in August is quite sunny. Everyone is undefeated, everyone has high expectations, and everyone's cliche game is already in midseason form. Our motto is win, what's important now. You know, if we uh, come ready to play every game, I'm going to say good things can happen every game. Our number one goal is, you know, you got to take one game at a time, and that's what we do. You know, right now the most important game we play is with Bonzi Valley. hate to sound cliche, but we want to take it game by game and, and really just beat our next opponent. That's what we're really looking to do. We can forgive Coach New. He and the Red Wings produce arguably the state's best turnaround in 2012, going from 1-8 to 11-2 last season, finishing one game shy of the 7A state title game. And there's reason for optimism that the Wings won't just be a one-hit wonder. Starting with an offense that returns a solid core led by left tackle Sean O'Mara, two-way spark plug Porter Anko, and junior QB Jack Beneventi. We have to prove ourselves, not just show that it was a one-time thing. So coach has really helped us with keeping the mindset of we're still hungry and we're still going to be working as hard as we possibly can. Beneventi is coming off a whirlwind of an offseason making unofficial visits to multiple schools and securing scholarship offers from the likes of Notre Dame and Louisville. He was also just ranked the number four QB in the class of 2015 by Scout.com, and his coach is looking forward to throwing more at him. I actually put, I put a new offense in last year and, and ran the offense, and um, uh, in doing so, I, I only put about 60% of the offense in. I, I kind of limited him a little bit, so we've got a couple more passing series, a couple more screens, and we're just expanding things a little bit more off of last year, and I think I know Jack can handle it. The hope in Lyle is that the offense can carry the load for a young defense, which will depend on Anko to be a leader. Iowa, 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 Iowa. The defense last year, we were, we were so experienced, we were so confident, we could just fly around, make plays, everyone knew their assignments. This year, we're equally confident. I mean, we know, everyone knows what they need to do. They know how they're going to do it. We've been practicing all year. Now from 7A to 8A, we move south to another team coming off its best season in school history while trying to create its own identity. For Niqua, gone is star tailback Joey Radigan, QB Dylan Andrew, and a host of defensive playmakers, also 2012's top five offensive linemen. But Coach Bill Ellinghouse was quick to remind me it isn't 2012. We're a totally different football team than we were in 2012, and, and these kids know it. Um, does that mean that you know, we can't go out and have the success that the 2012 team did? No, but we certainly have made it very clear to this team that we are not the 2012 Wildcats. We're 2013, and, and these guys got to make their own, their own legacy, so to speak. The offensive line is the biggest question mark at this point. Ellinghouse admitted they're not at game speed yet. Running back TJ Scruggs is doing what he can to help. I've been uh, trying to push the linemen and you know, fire off by running into the backs, so hopefully that gets them, you know, pushing. While the Wildcats haven't named a starting quarterback yet, either Matt Perigo, Connor Millerin, or Brock Rutter will have some weapons on the outside in Illinois commit Mikey Dudek, Ryan Cool, and Nate Hill. Defensively, Nico's strength looks to be its line, anchored by nose tackle Godfrey Collins II. A good start could be imperative for the Wildcats with every team on their schedule chomping at the bit for revenge, including two area rivals they knocked off twice. I would imagine they're working extremely hard. We work harder, I would say. Um, you know, they, I know they're looking to, you know, not beat the crap out of us, but uh, we're hoping um, hard work, you know, out here, on and off the field, weight room, uh, that that'll pay off, we'll, you know, beat them. Naperville North is one of those teams that was 0-2 against the Blue and Gold in 2012. Motivation comes easy for a senior class that hasn't beaten the Wildcats on any level and gets a shot week one. I know it really gets to the guys. You know, they have friends at Nequa and friends that live in Naperville. You know, they might be close and they, they always talk about how they're going to beat us this year and we're like, that's not going to happen because we know we have a strong group of kids this year. Like the Wildcats, the Huskies have a three-way battle for the starting QB job. But unlike Nequa, the candidates aren't afraid to get just as physical as everyone else. That's one of our points of emphasis that the game is physical and if we're going to be a zone read team, 
you know, our quarterback's got to be willing to lower his shoulder and hit someone. So they've done a good job of that thus far. The other thing to expect from North this fall is lots of plays and little time for the opposition to catch its breath. The Huskies ran 64.3 plays per game last season, eight and a half more than the next closest area squad. Drendel already has 2013's tempo turned up. You know, we like to at times get up tempo and, you know, then back it off and get up tempo. And we've tried to make, you know, nothing balanced for our team, you know, the way our practice is structured, you know, just trying to keep them not on, not on even ground and making plays when they're tired. The fourth year Husky head man also hopes to erase two straight 500 seasons. He's not alone. I think this year, you know, we got a lot of guys that are really, you know, it's their senior year, they really want to have a good year, you know, they're tired of going five and five and tired of getting knocked off in the first round, so it's time to go far this year. Wabonzi is coming off its best season in the eight-year Paul Murphy era, but also fell victim to Nequa twice last year. This season's Warriors return only seven starters and just two on defense. Even with those daunting numbers, one defensive returnee has tried to be constructive with the newcomers and says the message is simple. Just following your assignments, following your reads, um, not being afraid. You can't be afraid on the varsity level or else you're going to get hurt. You're going to like not help the team at all. You're going to hurt the team. You just got to come ready to play. On the other side of the ball, the Warriors have some beef. John Harris, Anthony Napolitano, and Noah Zott return on the O-line. And Harris makes the Warrior offensive formula sound easy. For every game, uh, our coach tells us the game's in our hands. So, I mean, if we do what we're, supposed, we're told, the running backs, all they need is a little gap, and they'll take off, have a lot of success this year. However, the backfield will look different this year. Austin Guido is at Western Michigan, and Dylan Warden is at North Central. But Paul Murphy is confident in Demario Webb, Jack Eddy, and ISU-bound wideout Christian Gibbs to shore up the skill positions. He also cites the Warriors team's speed as the best in his time at the school. I feel it can potentially be better than last year's team. Once again, time will tell, leadership, injuries, you know, how well they come together, how much they improve. And we got to improve on a daily basis. If we do, we've got a chance to be as good as anybody in the area. Wabonzi's well, week one opponent is coming off only its fifth non-playoff season since 1986. And it's no secret how Naperville Central will look to attack the opposition offensively, with ISU-bound quarterback Jake Colby and burner Ben Andreas. Ben and Jake have been attached at the hips this, you know, this entire offseason. And you know, I've, I've made this comment to some people outside of this, and I'll make it here. You know, I think in the 20, 20, uh, 7, 28 years I've been here, Ben is the is the best combination of speed and strength we've ever had at this school. Strength appears to be an asset in various areas for the Red Hawks. The red and white will average north of six feet and 250 on the offensive line. Speed is the feature on the other side. Yeah, you know, our defense is going to be real athletic. I mean, we, we got some real mobile guys, and that's really how we like to build our defenses, uh, guys that can run and, and, and move and fly and get to the ball. Players on both sides of the ball at Central have made it their goal to make last season history. you got to take last seasons for what it's worth and remember some of the things to motivate yourself but also just get away from it and forget about it and just work towards the season's goals and stuff but it's been good and I think we took what we needed to take from it and learn from it. In three years playing varsity football, Mattia Valley has yet to taste the postseason. Second year coach Ben Kleinhans has the deepest roster Mattia has ever had to work with, which he says has made practices more competitive and has changed the mindset of the Mustangs. There's just a feeling out here where there's an ex they expect to go compete and go you know, win games on Friday night as opposed to maybe in the past you know, playing hard and kind of hoping. Now they kind of have an expectation and confidence that we can go get this done. Another positive is a group of linemen that have been through a weight program at the underclass levels and have the size to compete with other teams in the rugged UEC Valley. It's been huge. I mean, and, and it adds to the depth that you're talking about. Definitely exciting up front to have some, you know, we feel like we can line down and push some people around. So we're looking forward to seeing if that carries over into the season, which we think it will. Quarterback Blaze Bell leads a group of skilled players that have plenty of varsity experience and a goal to leave their mark on the still young program. It's just that this year, uh, with the second year, um, with the coaches, us being with the coaches, like they put some more of their, their stuff in and uh, just us being more comfortable with the coaches, forming that chemistry. Um, I feel like we're trying to do some amazing things and we feel that it is our job, um, you know, to be the first to do a lot of things here at Matias. So. 
Each area squad has laid out its unfinished business. In just nine short weeks, we'll know who achieved what they set out to do. As the high school football season moves on throughout the fall, be sure to tune in to NCTV 17's Neighborville Sports Weekly to stay up to date on your favorite team's road to the playoffs. In 2011, the Bennett Academy girls volleyball team won the 4A state title. In the offseason, the Wings lost 95% of their offensive output by way of either graduation or transfer. All the new team did in 2012 was bring the state title back to Lyle again. This year, Bennett is in a similar spot with lots of new faces on the court. But as Justin Zipser reports, that doesn't seem to be slowing down the enthusiasm of the team as they gear up for another title defense. Expectations are high every year for the Bennett Academy girls volleyball program. And for good reason. The Red Wings took home their first 4A state title in 2011. And despite losing 11 girls in the offseason, the 2012 squad replicated the result with another state title. They wanted to prove people wrong because people kept telling them they can't. And you're not good enough, you can't do it. And they just kept saying we are. We are good enough, we're going to get it done. And they proved everybody wrong. New stars like Sheila Doyle, Kara Madliano, and Hannah Kaminsky took some of the pressure off with inspired play to lead the Wings. We worked hard every single day in practice getting as many extra reps as we can and they paid off tonight and feels really, really good. Flash forward to 2013 and the situation is nearly the same. Bennett has lost seven girls to graduation. A new crop of difference makers are set to take the reins for the team ranked 13th of the nation by PrepVolleyball.com. I mean, it's definitely a little bit different, but I think incoming seniors and incoming juniors are doing a good job of filling the shoes. So uh, practice environment is definitely still intense and competitive, which is what we want. We have great work ethic, and we're just trying to click as a team right now. We're focusing on the little things that matter in the long run. Part of how this team will learn to click is predictable. Practices on their home court at Bennett starting a few weeks before the team opens its season on August 30th. Despite nothing being on the line, these girls scrimmage with the intensity that one might find in a postseason match. It's easier to play hard than it is to, to be on the line. It's a lot easier and it's a lot more fun. And, but these girls are driven. They want this practice to be like this. The other part of how this team will learn to click is done off the court and in some interesting places. Watch your feet. On this muggy August day, the Red Wings find themselves going through a team building course at Lincoln Marsh, a wetlands area in the Wheaton Park District. One activity has the girls getting from one side of this obstacle to the other without touching the elastic strings. Another has them pushing each other over this 14 foot wall. Pull your wings like an adult. Keep, keep her feet touching like as long as possible. Like you know that someone's going to be there to catch you, and that can kind of translate to when like, you're down in a game, someone's there to pick you back up. The real reason why we won last year and are working to win this year is because we're such a close team, and you can really, if you're a close team, you can really pull out of bad situations. The truth is that the team will only start to truly gel once the season gets underway. While there's lots of tough teams on the 2013 docket, maybe Bennett's toughest opponent will be Bennett. It's, it's a lot of fun getting to the top, and then when you get to the top, it becomes more difficult, and there's expectations. Expectations that will put any of this year's accomplishments on a pedestal with those of years past. The program has lost only five matches over the past two years. There's a lot to live up to. We're our team. We're not looking for a three-peat. We're not looking for any re repetition of winning state, like we're winning our state title, we're winning our games. You can't ever replace players, everyone's going to be a little bit different and then you just try to build off what the strengths of the new players have because if you try to fit everybody, you know, everybody into the same square box, it's not going to work. One aspect that this year's team won't mind being compared is its potential college talent. Ten players from the two state title teams have gone on to play for Division I programs, including 2011 graduate Megan Haggerty. She closed her first year at the University of Nebraska with a selection to the Big Ten All-Freshman team. The Huskers finished a match short of the National Final Four. This year's Bennett team already has four players who have verbally committed to D1 schools, including Brittany Pavich to Boston College, Rachel Farah to Northwestern, Caroline Wolf to Wake Forest, and Natalie Canuli to Penn State. The latter two are only juniors. I mean, yeah, it's definitely weight off the shoulders, but 
it still makes me want to work hard and make me want to earn that spot at Boston College. So, I mean, it's pretty much the same. I try and work as hard as I, as hard as I did before as I am now. It's in the ACC, so I was really psyched about that, and I love the coaches and the girls, and I just think it's a great opportunity for me. This year's crop of verbal commits credit the hard work that Coach Baker has put them through at Bennett. The same hard work that could keep them atop the 4A state throne come November. I'm Justin Zipser for the home stretch. Today is Saturday. 60 minutes of physical activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. Get ideas. Get involved. Get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov. 28 years ago, nearly 5,000 participants competed in San Jose, California for the first ever World Police and Fire Games. The biennial Olympic-style event has since seen numbers explode, with more than 16,000 men and women converging upon New York City two years ago. One of Naperville's finest took to Belfast, Ireland for the 2013 edition of the Games, setting out to topple records and bring home the gold. Will Armistead reports. Notre Dame College Prep sits quietly in the North Shore, hiding among busy roadways, leading in and out of Chicago just 15 miles away. Mike Geiger lived blocks from Notre Dame, just east in Morton Grove. He was a Don, he was an athlete, and he had plans of playing football after high school, perhaps beyond. Preparing for football, Geiger started powerlifting at age 13. It was a routine for him, well before it was routine in high school programs. He was uh, an undersized offensive defense alignment for us, came to play all the time, but uh, his forte was, was weightlifting. And it wasn't so much bodybuilding, it was just weightlifting. How much can I press? How much can I bench? That's kind of the big thing in high school, you know. I mean, when you look back, you know, at least when I was going, how much you bench, you know, back and forth. It was an individual thing. You know, one-on-one -on -one where you're the person that pushes yourself. You're the guy who's got to make the commitment and discipline yourself to do it all the time. And for him to have had the success that he had back then as a high school kid, he just took it to another level because he was mentally ready and was a challenge for him. I think he liked that challenge. Geiger muscled his way through high school, bench pressing, an astonishing 405 pounds as a senior. And after graduation and a brief stint at Dakota Wesleyan, the undersized lineman earned an opportunity to play for Hayden Fry and the Iowa Hawkeyes in the fall of 1985. 1984 marked a middle-of-the-road finish in the Big Ten for the black and gold, but mediocrity wouldn't linger. A 5-0 start in 85 and an eventual number one ranking set the scene for an October meeting with then number two, Michigan. All right, and now we're just about ready for football history one way or the other. Just about ready for the play. The center ball is snapped. The kick is up, and it's long enough. And it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Iowa would go on to win the conference title and play in that year's Rose Bowl. Geiger, however, wasn't a participant. The first year red shirt set his only season on the team, quitting before taking a snap. What was starting to really become my passion was powerlifting, and I couldn't do it when I was playing football up there. If there's one thing that I could do in my life over, it would be to you know, complete all my years of football at Iowa. I went on, I, I think, I can't remember, I was national champion powerlifter and uh, collegial for powerlifting. I won the state of Iowa championship, I think, two or three times. When football fizzled, Geiger had the steady foundation in powerlifting. In high school, he recalled a Marine recruiter telling him he could be sent all over the world to lift weights. And although he didn't become a Marine, being an eventual globetrotter wasn't far off. I didn't see myself as being the type of guy to sit behind a desk or something like that. I wanted to do something where I could be active. I wanted to be on a SWAT team and, uh, and do all that, and I have. Geiger is a 22-year Naperville Police Department vet, and he gets to travel plenty representing the city at the International Police Games, Can-Am Games, and the World Police and Fire Games. His training for the 2013 WPFG in Ireland seems endless. 
I'll push it up 10 pounds. So now I'll go 325 for five, 345, and then I keep building. But I start out 10 weeks out with these programs. Two of our veteran detectives, Bill Nichols and Mark Carlson, uh, went to compete. And Mark was a triathlete and Bill was a power lifter. Bill had already been a world champion power lifter at that time, and he knew I was a competitive wrestler, and he invited me to go along. And really, uh, that's kind of what I did with Mike. When I was in Australia, I had 501, and I just had it too high on my chest. I had it all the way here, and I just couldn't lock it out. So a lot of that is so important when you're bringing that down, keeping that groove, very, very important. In Australia, Geiger set three world records in the push-pull competition despite not locking it out. The push is the bench press, and the pull is the deadlift. That was in 2007. In 05, Mike won gold in Quebec, and in his first worlds, like 07, Geiger set three world records in Barcelona, Spain. He was set to continue his record-breaking routine in 09 and 2011, but severe injuries marred any chance of repeat performances. At 47, Geiger feels good, he hasn't traveled the worlds in six years, but he and his current training partner, Harry Smith, are confident. Either he has said to me or I have said to him, you know, the other guys aren't doing this. Like, we take some pride in the fact that all our peer groups, they're not doing this. They're not putting this time in. They're not capable of this. And there's something interesting about that for him and I, clearly. That's 445, I'll open at 441. From there I'll probably go 470. I know I'll have that in the bag for sure. And then I'll go up to uh, probably 501 for my third attempt. Come right through. Press. Hello and welcome to Belfast, the host city of the World Police and Fire Games 2013. Sport and culture are two areas in which Northern Ireland has always punched well above its weight on the international stage. And the World Police and Fire Games provide the perfect opportunity to show off both. When I weigh in, you know, everybody's got their little groups going and, you know, I kind of take my bag, mind my own business, and nobody really knows who you are until that digital board goes up with your openers. But everybody wants to know, who's this guy from the United States? Geiger's 462 pound lift nailed a first place finish in the push portion, and later a third place finish in the pole would send him to the top spot on the podium. It marked his fourth world title, and for his supporters, it's the long awaited win he felt he owed them. For the 47 year old, it was a realization of something much more fulfilling. Life becomes all about memories. And, you know, what better memory can I give my children than an opportunity to see me compete? in a world championship, win it, set a world record, and then go on this once in a lifetime trip. Some of the best swimming talent in the state of Illinois resides right here in Naperville. While we get to enjoy many of the stars each year in their high school pools, the summer is a bit different. Many of the city's best are a part of a club team, and all 22 are governed by the Naperville Swim Conference. At the end of each summer season, the NSC holds the Naperville City Meet, an event that caps off the hard work put in during June and July and lets the swimmers blow off a little steam. Justin Zipser has that story. The Naperville City Swim Meet is a tradition that's been around much longer than any of this year's competing swimmers, even longer than some of their parents. For 46 years, club teams around the city have met to celebrate the summer swimming season that was. Over the course of the two-day event, 3,100 swimmers make their way into the pool, each of them part of a club team here in Naperville. The whole event is carefully looked after by meet director Dale Dionisotis. You want the kids to swim their best. They've been working hard all season and, and you really want them to swim their best at, at the city meet. It brings together all 22 squads from the Naperville Swim Conference, featuring swimmers aged anywhere from seven to 18. The first day of competition features the high schoolers. Some of the best in the city is pitted against each other, like Julia Roller of Naperville Central and former Nequa Valley Wildcat and soon-to-be Indiana Hoosier, Gia De Alessandro. 
it's really just the atmosphere. It's, everybody wants to be here and wants to have fun, and the competition's really good, and everybody's here to have a good time, and just the fast times are a plus. The Naperville Sports Weekly Female Athlete of the Year wrapped up the meet with four wins in her four individual events and has been involved in the city meet for years, sometimes as a racer and others as a coach. In fact, many of the day one athletes in the city meet come back for day two, where the spotlight shines on the younger swimmers. But the veterans aren't there just to teach. They're there to have fun. A long-standing tradition has been for the high schoolers to coach in outfits that can make you mistake the meet for a Halloween party. It's just a fun way to uh, connect with the kids as it's their last meet of the season. And we, we kind of want to have some fun too, so we all dress up in a funny way. For swimmers and coaches, it brings a sense of coming full circle. Lauren Podgman is the head coach of the White Eagle Warriors and began swimming on the team at the age of four. So I've been on the team for the past 20 years. Um, so I just went from a swimmer to a junior coach to an assistant coach to the head coach. And now I get to coach and try to be the fun coach that I loved when I was little. It's really fun because they, some of them are really challenging and, <laughs> and others of them are really sweet and stuff. So it's really fun like getting to work with all the little kids. Planning each meet is a year long process but the lion's share of the work is done about a month before. And on the two race days, the effort of over 300 volunteers makes the competition possible. They help time the meet, they help um, with hospitality, with the bullpen, getting all the kids ready to swim, uh, with the marshals, making sure people stay off the deck that aren't meant to be on the deck. So a lot of volunteer work, and again, we could not do it without the volunteers. It's all in service of a meet that features over 72 events, and within each event, multiple heats. Butterfly, IM, Backstroke, Relay, and more. The City Meet has all the events you expect from a swimming competition and has garnered lots of fans. And every session is, is basically sold out. The, the stands are full of spectators. In fact, um, there's a couple pools in Naperville that we can't use because the stands are, are too small. This year's city meet was held at Matia Valley's Aquatic Center, which also held the event in 2010. The meet committee likes to rotate throughout the area pools that can accommodate the crowd. Everybody's so carefree, but everybody wants to swim so fast as well. Um, and I think the parents are really into it as well. They want everybody to do, do really well. There are still winners and losers. The line between the two is getting smaller each year because the talent in the city is growing. It's super competitive. When I was in high school, like three of the people that I graduated with swam in college, and now it's way higher than that. I'm expecting some really fast times. I'm expecting a lot of records to be broken, um, a lot of outstanding records to be broken um, by the young ones and by the older ones. I think all of them are doable. But at the end of the day, the city meet is still about having fun. The costumes are proof. The whole idea is to, to make it fun for the kids and support the kids and, and kind of lighten the mood, so to speak, because there is a lot of pressure. Um, and it's, it's, it's all about making it fun for the kids and, and getting smiles on their faces. My favorite part is probably just the social aspect, getting to have lots of fun with people, because you make friendships that you can't really make anywhere else. And maybe down the line, the young swimmers of today will follow the tradition that's been set over the course of 46 meets by coming back year after year to complete the circle. I'm Justin Zipser for the home stretch. The racing proved to be very tight. The top three teams finished within 55 points of one another. Napier Carriage Hills took the top spot. Saybrook and Crest Creek rounded out the top three. Over three episodes of the home stretch, we've gotten to know a variety of individuals. Here's a couple updates. In June, we told you about local baseball star Ian Kroll realizing his major league dream with the Washington Nationals. In 27 appearances, the Nequa Valley grad has a 3.24 ERA, a 1.16 whip, and an impressive strikeouts per nine innings rate of 7.2. Also, former Naperville North Husky Charlie White has decided to put professional baseball on hold and return to the University of Maryland for his junior season. And finally, you could say 12-year-old Austin Mocha definitely held his own with the professionals at the Western Open Mini Golf Tourney. 
Mocha finished tied for 11th place with an average of 40 strokes over 10 rounds. That's it for this run of the home stretch. We hope you enjoyed watching as much as we did storytelling. Log on to nctv17.com to see the full schedule of sports programming we have coming up this fall. I'm Alex Simmons. We hope to see you then.